What's up everybody? Today we are going to be looking at pendulums and we're going to go over three things. We're going to go over kind of the derivation of the equation for the pendulum, especially with respect to simple harmonic motion. We'll talk about some of the concepts regarding the pendulum and then lastly we will do a example problem. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So in the pendulum problem you pull back a little weight you attach it to a string and when you pull it back you let it go it's going to start moving back and forth and hopefully you can already see that the motion is simple harmonic as it goes back and forth now why it moves in the first place well if we do a free body diagram on this you're going to have your weight coming down you're going to have the tension in the string this way now you can see already that these are not in equilibrium in fact, if we break this down into the components, you can see gravity is doing two things here. So part of gravity is kind of holding the string in tension. So this would be mg cosine. The angle here, if you could look at it, this angle is theta. If we just kind of extend this here, this angle is also theta, right? Those two angles are the same. Hopefully you can see that. So anyway, this one would be mg cos this component would be mg sine theta, right? So mg cosine theta, this kind of keeps it in uh, the, the string uh, taut. And then mg sine theta, this is what we'd call the restoring force. This is a force that actually causes the, um, causes the pendulum to move. All right, and as it starts to go down, that restoring force is going to decrease as the angles decreasing and then as you go in the other direction it's going to start pulling it backwards right slowing it down until it reaches this peak and then it's going to continue moving back and forth so that's simple harmonic motion let's go ahead and derive the equation for this so we're actually going to do a simplified equation this is for small angles so when we have small angles and I'm going to define small angles as maybe less than about 30 degrees. The smaller, the, the more this works. So for small angles, the sine of theta is approximately equal to theta. So in other words, if we're going to say F equals um, mg sine theta, well, we can say for small angles, F is approximately equal to mg theta. So we're going to set up an analogy with springs. Recall with springs, our Hooke's Law equation looked like this, f equals kx, where x was the amplitude of the spring, like how far you pulled it back. Well, for this, I mean, we're pulling it back a certain angle theta, but more specifically, we're pulling it back this distance here, right? And that distance here is if this is a length L, that distance is going to be L theta. So the analogy with the springs, remember this distance with the spring we would have simply called X here, right? And so X equals L theta. So if we take this down here, X equals L theta, or theta equals X over L. So notice what we have, let me use a different color here for our pendulum pendulum equation is going to be F equals mg x over L. So notice this. Basically, our quote-unquote k for pendulums is mg over L. So I'm doing all this to derive the equation. So let's go ahead and look back at our spring. This is basically for simple harmonic motion. For a spring, it looks like this. T equals 2 pi square root of m over k. And what we're going to do is for this k, we're just going to go ahead and substitute that in. So this would be T for the spring. We'll substitute this in k over here. And if you allow me, I'm just going to do all the algebra for you, but you can go ahead and do it as a, as a practice to see what you end up with. But you get 2 pi L over G. Do you need to know this derivation? No, not necessarily. But I just want you to see that we're not pulling this 
equation out of thin air, that it comes, uh, comes from somewhere, basically the restoring force, and then kind of making this analogy with the springs. All right, let's talk about some concepts. So let's talk about some concepts. The first thing is I want you to notice that mass is not in the equation. Okay, so mass doesn't matter. Hopefully this makes sense to you. We've been talking about this since day one in this class. Like if you use a huge mass here, right, the force goes up. So you might think, oh, it's going to go faster. But the mass also goes up. And since A equals F over M, if they're both increasing, then the acceleration's the same. If the acceleration is the same, the time would be the same, etc., etc., right? So the other thing to notice is length. Length does matter. So if you increase the length of this, okay, notice that the, the distance this travels is going to increase, okay? But the acceleration is still going to be the same. So it accelerates the same, but it has to travel a greater distance. So if it has to travel a greater distance, it should take a longer period of time. Okay, and you can see that in the equation. As L goes up, T is also going to go up. Okay, what about G? Well, G is basically how strong gravity is pulling on it. So if you have, if G goes up, let's just look at the equation first. If G goes up, then you see that the T is going to go down, right? Inversely related. Hopefully this makes sense. If you have more gravity acting on this, the stronger gravity pulls on it, it's going to pull harder, right? If it pulls harder, that means the force goes up. That means the acceleration goes up. The force and the acceleration both go up. The velocity goes up, and then the time it takes to go here and back is going to decrease. One last concept I wanted to look at was um, energy. And we've been talking a lot about forces, but energy is also, you know, conservation of energy applies here as well. So, for example, when we pull this back, we have all gravitational potential. As it starts to fall, that gravitational potential gets turned into kinetic energy. So at this point, kinetic energy would be kind of maximized, right? And then it's going to keep moving, and then all that kinetic energy is going to be turned into potential. And so forth and so on. So it's just going to continue to move back and forth, back and forth, right? Continually changing from potential to kinetic to potential and, and so on. All right, let's go ahead and do an example problem. So in this example, we're going to be um, designing, let's say, a clock. Let's say you want to create a clock where you want to know what length of string is needed on this clock in order to create a period of one second. Remember, the period is the time it takes to go back and forth. So from here and um, from the beginning to the end, and then it repeats. So the equation for this, 2 pi square root of L over G, okay? We want the time to be one second, and we're looking for the length to do that. Okay, we're on Earth. I guess we didn't specify that, but we can make that assumption. And then we're just going to go ahead and solve for, um, solve for L. So we'll go ahead and divide by 2 pi. That equals square root of L over 9.8. Let's go ahead and square both sides. Okay, that gives us, uh, let's write it like this, 1 over 4 pi squared equals L over 9.8. And then we'll just multiply by 9.8. So L equals 9.8 divided by 4 pi squared. Go ahead and plug that in and we get approximately 25 centimeters or 0.25 meters. Okay, notice what if we wanted the time to double? Let's just do an extra bonus question. If we wanted the time to double, so notice here we have t is a approximately equal to the square root of L. Oops, not approximately equal to. What do I want to say? Proportional to the square root of L. Or t squared is proportional to L. Right? So if t were doubled, 
we want L to be quadrupled. So L in this case would basically be one meter. So one meter would give you a time of two seconds back and forth, or halfway would just be one second. So many clocks, especially those big grandfather clocks, they kind of use this concept, right? So one, one half period is going to be one second, another half period is going to be a second second, and so forth and so on. All right, hope that was helpful. Please let me know if you have any questions, and I'll see you in the next one.